All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Aperio session on Hacks Web Components, Data Standards, and XAPI, Leveraging Student Data Analytics for the Learner, presented by Dr. Dave Fusco. Dave has worked as an executive technology leader for over 25 years. In that time, Dave has done everything from being a developer, network engineer, CIO, VP, and now an assistant teaching professor and interim associate dean at Penn State University. Dave is passionate about leveraging technology to help improve teaching, learning, and most importantly, the learner. Recently, Dave has been working on several startups revolving around Internet of Things, XAPI, data science and analytics, and creating crowdsourced learner-focused solutions. In his spare time, he enjoys time with his family, doing triathlons, and working on his 1981 Fiat X19. You'll find him either outside most of the time or tinkering with something mechanical and always learning. Welcome, Dave. And I'm going to turn it right on over to you. Oh, and I need to, yes, go ahead and present. Yeah. When Thank you. Ready. Thank you, Tricia. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming this morning. I see some familiar faces. Uh, <clears throat> good to see all of you. I'm going to share my screen here first. And uh, can you can you get, give me a quick confirmation, Tricia, that you can see my yes. uh, presentation? Good. And yes. I'm coming through loud and clear, I'm assuming. So yes, you are. Awesome. So thanks everybody again for coming this morning. It's, it's great to see all of you. Uh, today I'm going to talk about some things that I've been working on um, here at Penn State and with a group of people here and, and some other universities. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about web components, a little bit of XCPI and looking at uh, learner uh, analytics um, as we look at things from the perspective of the learner. And so what you'll see is a lot of today's Ed tech tools typically tend to be uh, vendor driven, and um, you know I've been I've been teaching now for over 25 years um, at four different institutions, and I've been an administrator. And so what I've noticed is a lot of these tools tend to focus on um, how can we make life easier for the instructor. And so I noticed that a lot of ed tech tools tend to be a little bit more vendor driven, a little bit more helping the instructor, which is fine, but I think that um, where I think there's a lot of value add in, uh, in creating tools for um, higher education and education in general is to really focus on a learner-driven approach where we can understand from a learner perspective and provide feedback um, as quick as we can back to the learner about the kinds of um, constructs that they're trying to solve and understand uh, for themselves. And so this really comes from a lot of different areas. Um, it could come from our student information system. It could come from what I'll talk a little bit about, which is what an, an LRS and, and looking at ways in which we can create this persona and helping the, the learner understand really what, what's going on in their lives um, from, a, from a standpoint of what the technology that they're using. So along comes XAPI. Some of you may know this as Tin Can API. Um, this is, um, you might have also heard from, I don't want to call it its predecessor, but SCORM is something that you might have seen, or even Caliper is, is another implementation of this. And the idea of XAPI um, stands for Experience API. And the idea is that we're going to capture experiences um, at a micro level of what students do as they interact with lots of different things. And so XAPI isn't necessarily meant to be um, an all-in-one solution. It's meant to, to be um, a transport mechanism to capture learning experiences from a number of different areas. And so there's lots of, of software packages and lots of things that are, that are looking at how we can leverage um, XAPI. Um, it's not an L you know, it's not an LTI, it's not a way that we can bridge um, technologies together, but it's a way for us to capture experiences. And so the pieces behind this is that we have some end um, object, whatever that object is, whether it's a piece of software um, or a literal object. In some cases, um, I've, I've built some XAPI compliant uh, devices around IoT and some other physical things, but it's some endpoint 
we leverage this piece in the middle, which is this transport mechanism, this tin can API or X API. And we store this into what's called a, a learning record store, which is um, an LRS. Um, and Tricia, I'm assuming you're kind of watching the, the chat here. You'll, you'll kind of let me know if anybody. Absolutely. Jumps in. Yes. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, so um, you might have, you've, all, you've obviously heard of an LMS or a CMS, and depending on which iteration you're on, you might call them, you know, different things. But an LRS is, is not the same thing as either of those two things. It's a, it's a learning record store. And the idea is that we create an activity that happens and we transport it using X API and we, and we tuck it away in, in this thing called an LRS. And I'm going to show you today that I, I kind of uh, built my own uh, browser-based LRS. Um, but the idea is that the, the core of an X API statement is that we have an actor, verb, and object in that we have a person, in this case, a student does something, verb, um, with some object. Um, and so that's the core of this. An actor, a uh, student does something with something. And we can also store auxiliary kinds of information as to whether or not they passed a particular um, thing that they interacted with. If that's a multiple choice quiz, you can store whether they passed. You can store context around it. Um, and you can also describe any physical web extensions that may have happened with this. Um, it's not meant to replace, uh, you know, a student information system that um, stores obviously a course roster or things like that. Um, and it's not necessarily meant to replace a grade book either. I want you to think of this as an experience, a, a micro experience. A student did something with something but we can also store these other things with it as well. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of code today and I, and I don't know what the audience here is as far as our, our comfort level with, with coding, and, and, but I'm, I'm gonna spend some time with that and, and we can kind of go down that, that rabbit hole as much or, or as not as you'd like, but um, very straightforward, very flat in its structure um, for, for an API statement. Um, you'll see that um, XAPI at its core uh, stores very flat information, very non-relational type information. And so you'll find that this information, again, is not meant to replace a database. Um, but the idea is that we want to connect these statements around um, the kinds of outcomes that you're looking for in a given course. And you can kind of take this everywhere from large scale course down to, you know, micro assessment levels. I mean, XAPI is really built around looking at things from a, a small of an experience as possible, but then in a hierarchy, it can build up and support kind of as much of the learning activity as you want upwards. You can also tie this into a digital taxonomy if you wish, looking at ways in which you might wanna find um, if students are remembering things, um, and then again, from a hierarchy, you can kind of build this up. There are, are, there are a number of people that specialize in and are doing XAPI um, learning outcomes analysis and framework design. Um, and you can find lots of different resources for that. Um, but, but for sure, you can look at this from kind of a, a building process. Those things that you want your students to ba basically understand. Again, learner perspective, not teacher perspective. And this is my philosophy and how I, I look at things. Um, so the infrastructure typically to build um, an XAPI infrastructure, lots of people kind of ask, well, how do you get started with this? You can, you can use a learning locker LRS if you wish. Um, it's really built around a mean stack. Um, and you can spin these, these instances up. Um, there's, there, again, there's lots of different um, ways to spin up cloud services. If you want to get started on a, on a learning locker, there are cloud-based services that are already spun up for you. Or if you want to spin up your own, um, you can do that as well. This is everything I'm showing you today I didn't mention is um, open source. Um, and so uh, everything that I'm showing for you today is also free. So you can, you can kind of do these things um, fairly easily. Um, I think most of the things you can do, there's a good bit of documentation on how to get this started. 
Okay, so that's kind of the background of, of where, um, where I, I've gone with this. I, I've kind of, um, I'd say about a year ago or so, this is kind of where I was. I was at a point where I was building infrastructure. I was building, you know, a number of apps that, that tie in um, to these different kind of services. But I started getting involved more locally with, um, if, if those of you who know Brian Olendike at Penn State and, and familiar with the Hacks project, uh, I'll talk about that here in a second. But where I decided to go with this was um, to really start to look at this from a local database perspective. Um, and that is storing data, again, from a learner perspective locally within the browser. Now you might wanna ask yourself, why would you want to store this locally in the browser? You just said a second ago that you need to spin up a learning record store in the cloud somewhere. Well, you don't have to. And the, and the kind of the cool thing about XAPI statements are that um, as long as you store XAPI compliant data, that data becomes transportable to other things, other kinds of services like Learning Locker that understand an XAPI statement. And so I started building things around this idea that why don't we start store things more locally inside a browser, right? Um, and so um, we wanted to, I wanted to store things locally um, because of speed uh, and because I wanted to be able to make them more learner centric, okay? So this is kind of my journey as to where I got to where I am today. Um, if you're familiar with hacks, uh, you probably, maybe you saw, uh, a session yesterday with, like I said, with Brian Olendike. Um, Hacks is um, something that a, a team of us are working on, not only at Penn State, but a number of in other institutions. Um, and we're looking at ways in which we can leverage web components. And, and I won't kind of give you the whole, um, the whole overview of, of web components, but the general idea is that we want to be able to leverage um, these um, independent components where we can build digital assets um, in, in really a, a building block um, atmosphere. Uh, I'll do a quick shout out for Brian's session today and tomorrow uh, from two to six. He's doing a Hacks Camp session, um, which is really kind of a, an all-in-one learning session if you wanna check that out today. Um, Brian's really cool. I'm sure if you kind of check in at any time, he'll, he'll, you'll be, most certainly welcome to those sessions. Uh, so the idea really around this Hacks the Web is that we're gonna create this NGDLE, which probably, I don't know, came out about six years ago, I wanna say, it was really when it started picking up steam, this next-gen digital learning environment. And so what I've been building and the, and the web components and hacks, this is all part of an entire ecosystem and it's not meant to replace or create a single software component, which is really what I started off with, which is this idea that a lot of systems today are built around vendor driven ideas. And, and so we're trying to really build things in a component based idea. Um, my idea today, I'm going to talk about really six different uh, web components. I list them here um, and these are all um, you can find all of these on the LRN Web Components GitHub repo down there at the bottom. Um, and I'm happy to, to share any of this that um, if you're kind of wondering about the details behind any of these, um, I'd be happy to, to share any of those with you. And I'll save some time here uh, at the end for some questions as well. Just checking in, Trisha, real quick. Any questions in the chat? No, nope, nothing yet. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Um, so what uh, we'll be looking at here today are these six different web components. And the general idea um, and part of my discussion here today is to really look at creating a data framework for what, I, what we're gonna call hacks data visualization. And I'm gonna switch, switch over here to um, see if that's a little bit better. Uh, that we can look at this idea. So the idea is that we have this XAPI based data standard. We have a web component. And if you understand what a web component is, um, it's, a, it's a way for us to create an independent block of a, a widget, so to speak, right? 
that is that is browser friendly um, that in this case is going to emit some data right and that particular data is going to be emitted and I am using what's called uh, a pouch database which is an, a, a, a version of uh, open source um, couch database which stores data in the browser directly so the idea is that this web component emits data the pouch data is listening it creates this listener um, listening for a particular type of event that has happened and i take this data from that's xapi compliant and i tuck this away into um, a locally stored pouch database all in the browser right um, the idea where I'm trying to go with this in the future, and I'd be interested to hear any feedback you have with this, is that um, I've also created a data viz web component built on this. And so you'll see that this is, again, this, this whole component-based idea is that we have this object that, that emits some data. I grab it via pouch, tuck it away in the browser, um, I can also extract that data if I want to from this data viz uh, web component and that in turn uses a Chartist render. And if you're familiar with Chartist, it's again um, an open source uh, uh, chart based um, web component. And in this case, I'm going to draw a bar chart. Okay, so the general idea is again I'm going to have some object emit some data and I could also pull that data out, show the data, all of this based around the idea of uh, these independent web components. Okay. Okay. So let's, uh, let's jump over and kind of see this in action. This is obviously all running locally on my machine here. I could certainly demonstrate that pouch does work offline, but then I'd have to kill my internet connection in order to do that. So I don't want to, don't want to do that. So this is, um, this is my basic pouch demo and I have uh, my console pulled up here. And what you'll notice here is that I have, I won't try not to scroll too fast, make you dizzy. Um, I have a number of different web components in this particular screen on the left. I have what's called an alley collapse uh, select. I have a multiple choice quiz, um, different versions of multiple choice quizzes here. Um, and you can kind of get down through here. This is all posted in our demo in the web component online um, in that GitHub repo that I showed earlier. And then we have this, what's called a self check. And you might kind of wonder, well, how would you be using all of these different things? Well, it depends on what your goals are, right? If you want to know that students are interacting with the self check, you might just want to know that they did this. You might want to know how a student did on this multiple choice quiz right? You might want to know, did the student interact with this collapse um, element, right, on your web page? And so again, think in terms of the XAPI statement is going to be cut or created every time we have a student does some kind of a micro learning activity. Okay, so I want you to kind of watch um, over here on the right hand side. And what you'll notice here is that when I click on this particular event. And again, it's just a collapse element. It's just an interaction element. You'll notice two things happen. Um, first, and, and you know, when I found out when I started doing this, people were like really interested in seeing the visualization of this. So I found out really quickly that I needed to not just store this data, but I needed to visualize it pretty quickly. So this is the Chartist render uh, web component that um, basically is a data pull outside of this pouch DB. Um, and then I visualize it depending on, and, and this just shows very simple data uh, as far as how much people interacted with a given uh, component within the page. If you come over here in the console, um, this is just me in my demo showing an output. I know it's a little small, it's not meant to be um, super readable, but as, as you kind of come down here, you'll notice that um, this particular uh, pouch database is storing all of these independent 
XAPI statement. So all these things you see on the right hand side are all of my XAPI statements. And um, as I hover over this one here, you'll notice that the XAPI statement itself gets tucked away inside this pouch database. Um, and I could very easily take this uh, independent XAPI statement or any of these and export them out or make them connectable with other XAPI complaint compliant databases and they would be fully usable in any other XAPI compliant system. Um, as a side note, PouchDB has a remote sync capability that I also, uh, I'm not going to do that today. I don't have enough time, but um, I can also sync this data with a remote PouchDB um, out in the cloud wherever I'd like it to be um, or multiple pouch um, databases. Um, so that's the general idea of being able to store an XAPI compliant within this pouch database. And, and all of these are basically just XAPI statements. Um, at Penn State, we have an LRS that I think for one course in a semester generated something like 1.2 million XAPI statements uh, this last semester. And so it's, you can imagine, you can generate lots of XAPI statements. The same thing with this very simple kind of um, checkbox, you know, check the answer. And what you'll find is that my, my data visualization up here will automatically kind of update every time I interact with that multiple choice quiz. And this again is just a, it's just an interaction checker, you know, just, a, a, just for this demo for today. And you could do whatever you wanted with any of this data that's stored um, in the pouch DB. I have about eight minutes left. Um, I'm gonna just show very quickly some code. Um, and I do wanna save some time here for questions. So um, I'm keeping an eye on the time here, but um, I, I'll, I'll kind of give you my information here at the end. We can kind of talk some code later if you like, but, um, and, and I'm sure if you go to Brian's session later, he'll go over lots of different web components, but pulling these independent components in is really simple. Um, and I'm not doing this any justice at all, but, but you basically import your web component and implementing my pouch DB web component is literally just that. Just implementing and pulling it in um, will automatically implement what I've built inside that independent web component. The data viz, which is that, that data visualization piece is literally just that particular uh, tag referencing um, my web component. And the same goes for a number of these other independent web components. Um, I'm not gonna go into the independent code at this time. Um, I think what I'd like to do is stop here. Um, I wanna make sure I give some time trying to be cognizant of your of our time here today. Um, we've got about six minutes left, so I thought I'd stop and ask uh, or answer any questions you might have. Dave, this is really amazing. And I have to say my mind is blown with this pouch DB. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I found cool. it. Yeah. So folks, surely you have questions for Dave. Either um, go ahead and type them in the chat or feel free to come to enable your mic and just ask them. Looking to see if uh, I have one of my teammates is here today as well. Mike Potter is here today, and I'm sure he'll be online later with the Hacks Camp session. And uh, he will do the web component talk way better justice than I have done here this morning. So, um. <laughs> oh, great. So we do have a question. Are you pushing the local data back to a central data store? Great question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's this idea of um, PouchDB is meant to be by default a, a local browser-based 
uh, system. Um, but you'll notice here, the question is right now, I, I have it turned off, but enabling this remote database sync, and I'm trying not to scroll too fast here, again, to make you dizzy, but um, literally um, turning this on for uh, a remote sync is, um, of course, you have to have the remote database set up. Um, and in this case, it was in my AWS instance. You have to have it set up to you know, take, uh, acknowledge the, the X API statements. But it's literally um, turning this to true and uncommenting this. Um, and the, the pouch DB web component has it built in that it'll automatically sync uh, every time an X API statement is cut. And I can, it's later on in the code. But to answer your question, um, I have it turned off now, but I have turned it on and had it working before. So yeah, and it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's not that difficult to do. What else can I share with you today? The other things, um, I'm not seeing any chats popping up here, but um, I can show you real quickly here that um, the differences between the different web components and where I've turned this on for um, basically emitting data, you'll see it's very standard in that when I create this custom event of user engagement, um, I basically pass over this event data um, from that particular web component. So multiple choice, I can pass over again, this is my verb, it's an XAPI compliant verb. I can pass over the name of the quiz so that you can, and that's why when you saw um, here on my uh, different quizzes, um, each one of these independent quizzes have an associated attribute for the name of the quiz. And then I just pull that out inside the web component itself. And then I passed over how many um, the student got right, which I pull from the component. Self-check looks very similar. Um, I, I obviously um, hard coded some of this just for the demo, but um, very similar data framework. And then alley collapse, literally uh, very similar. Uh, I changed the verb from answered to focused. And there's a list of XAPI compliant verbs that you can pull from uh, for this. Um, and again, I just stored that they actually did it. Uh, again, you can kind of decide how you want to use this. Um, but so I'm, I'm kind of looking where I'll, where I'll leave this uh, with a couple minutes left. Where I'm interested is getting feedback. If you think about this later, after you leave this session, um, I'm looking to get feedback on how we can, you know, I, I kind of designed this model around how we can store data uh, and then visualize it for the learner. But I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are as you build your own web components, reach out to me and let's, let's kind of build on this framework with your components. Um, we can use the stuff that I built and, and tie it right into this, these other, um, the Chartist render and, and other web components that are you know, easily available for us. So I'll stop there and um, thank you all for coming today. And uh, I really appreciate you attending and thanks for letting me share this with you. Great, Dave. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was really cool and uh, lots to think about here for all of us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So folks, you can head.